Um, I've been participating in all the conferences so far, and I have to say that I was really happy to see how the conversation and the dynamic is maturing. I think data for policy is an area that is growing within the academic, the academic environment, within government, and I think the discussions that we've been having in the conference in the past two days reflects this higher maturity. And um, in the final plenary, we would like to connect the old discussion that um, has happened in the past two days on data uh, to the uh, a policy domain, which is extremely connected to the relevance of using data to create value, which is public sector innovation. And the title of the session is, Can we make public sector innovation sustainable in the public sector? And I think that there are some points that were discussed in the past two days that I would like to bring to the table to introduce the, the panelists and the discussion that we will be having with the panelists because I think they are very relevant, especially if we want to draw the connection between the use of data for improving policy making and service delivery and public sector innovation. I think that some of you have very nicely and very uh, politely made a very key point, which is administrations and public sectors and governments are still very much silo-based and bureaucratic in their dynamics. This hinders and makes it more complicated to use data across administrations in an innovative way. So the question is, to what extent this reality reflects also problems that exist for uh, having public sector innovation grow across the public sector. Automation in decision making and the use of data to improve this automated decision making is a way also to be more innovative when we take decisions with design policies and with design services. Collaborations through the use of data create new dynamics within the administration and that can actually have an impact on how we innovate in the way the public sector organizations work uh, with each other. Use of data in a number of examples that were presented is actually helping innovate also how we monitor and implement, uh, sorry, monitor and evaluate implementation of public policies and transparency, scrutiny and explicability of the use of data as we change the way we uh, manage our processes has also came up as a key uh, point. So can we make these interesting examples that are emerging across public sectors and in the academic environment a bit more sustainable and can we link it then better with the uh, policy on public sector innovation across our governments? Uh, to answer that question, I was uh, actually given the honor to moderate a panel that groups very distinguished speakers and uh, uh, academics. I'm going to start by introducing them and then I will give each one of them the floor for a few minutes to introduce some key reflections of the key questions from their side. I will start with Diego. Diego Ponen is CEO of Statu Consulting and Professor of Data Science at Geneva School of Economics and Management, University of Geneva, Switzerland. Diego founded Statu Consulting in 2001 and he regularly consults on applying statistical thinking to big data analytics for businesses and government bodies in Switzerland and across Europe at operational, tactical and strategic level. In 2016, is, since 2016, he's also professor of data science at the GCEM at the University of Geneva and founding director of GCEM News, uh, Master, New Master of Science in Business Analytics and uh, Program. Since 2016, he's also the principal scientific and strategic big data analytics advisor and consultant for the directorate and the board of management for the Swiss Federal Statistical Office and is the author of the FSO Data Innovation Strategy book that was published in 2017. Julia Stoyanovic is an assistant professor of computer science and uh, data science at New York University. In her research, she focuses on developing technical methods for incorporating ethics and legal compliance into all data science life cycle stages. She engages in regulatory efforts in New York City, where she serves the, automatic, uh, the Automated Decision System Task Force, appointed by the New York City Mayor to provide recommendations to city agencies on responsible use of algorithms and data. She developed and taught a technical course on responsible data science, which is offered at NYU, and her research has been funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, and also through an award that was granted to her. And Nicholas Wright, um, the third panelist, is an affiliated with USL, Georgetown, New America, and Intelligent Biology. His work combines neuroscientific, behavioral, technological insights to understand decision-making in politics 
and international confrontations. Pony High he advises the US and the UK government, as well as the European tech company, SAP. Foreign Affairs chose this piece on AI and global order at the top of 10 2018 uh, uh, released uh, articles on the net, and he's editor of forthcoming book on AI, China, Russia, and the global order. Natasha McCarthy leads the Royal Society's policy team working on data and digital technologies, which has carried out work on AI and machine learning, governance of data use, data skills, and the privacy and security of data. She has held a number of positions in science, technology, and research policy, and has worked extensively on engineering, ethics, and the philosophy of engineering. And last but not least, Jack Tintail is a manager for design and innovation policy at the cross-party think tank Policy Connect. In his role, he runs the whole party parliamentary group on data analytics, studied economy history at LSC, graduated in 2012, and is keen to work uh, sorry, his work is keen to promote better public policy on data by bringing together parliamentarians, academics, and industry. So I think this uh, long introduction was meant to show how much different profiles, uh, skills, competencies, and uh, areas of expertise are actually needed, in my point of view, to foster public sector innovation in a way that might be sustainable. And in that sense, I'd like to invite Diego to start with sharing with us some of his thoughts on how can we make it sustainable, uh, public sector innovation across the public sector. Okay, thanks for the introduction. It's a great honor to be here. And I give you briefly my view, starting with what I think is innovation. So it's the way how organizations update, change, and improve their processes, products, and their management methods. And also with respect to delivering better quality to better satisfy user needs. And therein, me measuring, managing, and communication of the innovation is key to success. So it's about innovation management. Those who know what statistics is about, it's about measuring, managing, and communicating uncertainty. So as a professional statistician, there are a lot of parallel things to innovation. And one thing I have with my eight, more than 18 years experience as a consulting on the private sector, is the first thing if you go for innovation, you have to decide which, what's called the spirit animal you want to take. You want to be the tortoise or you want to be the hare. <laughs> Everybody nowadays wants to be the hare because there's money around. And it's a bad, much better strategy to be the best tortoises on the planet. And to also with respect to trust, to make this innovation trustworthy, <coughs> viable and also relevant. This brings me basically to the point where the public sector innovation or sustainable innovation should look like it, if it's not data informed, because it has to be measured, it has to be managed, and it has to also be communicated. So it has to be data informed. So therein, we basically know by the word data. If you want to have this sustainable, the veracity of the data, so the trustworthiness of the data, including the related data quality is more important than ever. Some, some, with respect to some, some sustainable data quality, just to give you some examples, if you start measuring innovation, we need to guarantee and access the required data sources. We need to guarantee linkability of different data sources, and not only of data, also of the metadata. And we also have to assess whether we have comparability over time, etc. All of this, basically, is a community called official statistics who have internationally agreed standards how to cope with these challenges since more than one year in place. And this is something with respect to trustworthiness because trust, you cannot buy trust. You have to earn it. And you earn it by demonstrating trustworthiness. And nowadays there is a lot of tendency in a lot of companies to reinvent the wheel and for example, in official statistics, there are frameworks which could be adapted to any public sector initiatives. There is also an emphasis on communication and transparency in her. So what's very important is that public sector or governments or any company, they don't need an innovation strategy. What they need is a better, let's call it business strategy, which, which is enabled by innovation. So it has to be made with leadership top-down. So it's really key that innovation is not about technologies.
because so the technologies will change. So the focus has to be on the transformation. And the transformation starts with the culture. So you can have the best strategies in place, enabled by innovation. If the mindset is not ready to make it, then it will basically not be worth. So in this sense, like a summary, I think the key need for, for sustainable innovation is trustworthy data. Because this we need to measure, manage and also to communicate public sector innovation in a sustainable way. Thank you. Okay. Hi everybody. Having a good day? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Julia Stojanovic uh, and uh, as uh, was part of the kind introduction, I'm a professor of computer science and of data science at New York University. Uh, my background is in data management, also known as databases. So we are a systems community within computer science that is really focused on uh, pragmatically building data systems, systems that would be efficient and effective and usable in the general purpose context, that would scale and that would be usable by the people at whom they're targeted. And so I bring that point of view, uh, the point of view of a pragmatic engineer, to the discussion today. Uh, and as was also mentioned, I'm part of a regulatory effort in New York City that I'm happy to discuss in, uh, during the discussion further. Uh, so to, to start, I would say that, of course, the use of technology and of data that fuels technology has a tremendous opportunity for positive impact, in particular in the public sector, where the opportunity is really to make things more efficient, to help in a personalized manner the people who are the most vulnerable in the community and to overall increase, uh, make our society more equitable and more just, right? So this is the opportunity and this is why we're <laughs> gathered here today. Uh, my position though is that sustainable innovation, particularly in the public sector, must be based on a concept that we call responsibility by design. Um, and what I mean by that is that we need to be incorporating ethical principles and legal compliance into the design of uh, and use of technology and data from the ground up. Not as an afterthought, not in a post-processing step, not so as to fix the problems that technology amplified, but rather from the very start we need to think in terms of uh, ethics and legal norms when we design technology. And I will now highlight uh, components of a three-pronged approach to responsibility and desi uh, uh, by design that my colleagues and I have been developing. The first component of this approach concerns basic and applied research, which essentially is really the bread and butter of what I do as a computer science and data science faculty member. Uh, and our goal here is to treat responsibility and the properties of responsibility to include fairness, diversity, accountability, transparency, and data protection as a systems requirement in the sense of socio-technical systems, software systems. Uh, with generous support from the U.S. National Science Foundation, we have been working on multiple projects in this space, and I will mention just two. One of them is uh, a set of tools to produce semi-synthetic data sets in which privacy of individuals who are included in those data sets is respected, and also that bias is corrected in the data bias that is due to results of historical discrimination. Uh, in conjunction with this effort that supports our data sharing activities and supports government transparency ultimately, uh, we have also been developing methods for data interpretability, building on the metaphor of a nutritional label in the food industry uh, that explains data, an input, an output of a process, or some intermediate data sets to a variety of stakeholders in a way that is comprehensible and useful for the stakeholder in question. Generalizing beyond semi-synthetic data and nutritional labels, I hold that responsibility by design requires a holistic view of the data life cycle, starting with data sharing and annotation through data acquisition and curation, to data cleaning, data integration, querying and ranking, and finally to result analysis, validation and interpretation of these results. And in our work, we envision a platform called FIDES that will embed responsibility by design in all of these life cycle stages. 
The second component of responsibility by design is education. And here I mean that it is very important, of course, to educate students in higher ed settings, to educate undergraduate and graduate students in computer science, data science, as well as other disciplines. Uh, but also, very importantly, we currently lack methods to educate uh, data practitioners in industry and in government. And these include data scientists who are developing the methodologies. These include data stewards, very importantly, the people who are in charge of responsibly guarding and sharing the data, which is one of the main assets of companies and governments these days. Uh, and we need to develop methods to educate the general public about the opportunities and the risks of data-driven innovation. Uh, I have been developing course materials at NYU uh, and uh, as part of a new technical class called Responsible Data Science. I wanted to point this out because all of my materials are publicly available. I encourage all of you to use them and to give me feedback and let's work together to develop more materials both for higher ed and also to amplify our reach uh, and to develop new methodologies to reach practitioners and the general public. Uh, very briefly, the third component of responsibility by design is, of course, policy, policy engagement. Uh, that is, engaging multi-stakeholder groups, including academics, policy makers, industry representatives, and members of the public, in developing appropriate regulatory mechanisms for the difficult and exciting space of data-driven algorithmic decision-making in which we find ourselves today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to learning about effective methods uh, for this, from others in the room, and I'm also happy to share my experience on the New York City Automated Decision Systems Task Force uh, that is set up to provide uh, transparency guidelines to New York City agencies with an eye on individual rights, fairness and equity, explanations, and public oversight. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm Nick Wright, because uh, you probably have forgotten my name by now. Uh, so, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, perspective, which is a bit more of a global perspective. Uh, and I'd argue we can't see the creation of stable innovation in uh, public sector digital uh, technologies unless we understand that there is a growing strategic global competition, in particular uh, between China and the United States. Okay, and now this is a largely separate phenomenon from all the digital advances we've had. You know, China's growing uh, economic strength, and military strength and so on would be causing anxiety in the United States regardless of any new digital technologies. But in addition to that, we have these new digital technologies and, and that's really impacting on how things are seen in the US. And so we have a global competition between China and the United States and the digital technologies are going to uh, play a key uh, role in that growing competition. Uh, and one important dimension of that is the effect that digital technologies have on domestic political regimes. So, you, you know, a lot of people here work in government and so on, and government fundamentally is part of uh, a domestic political regime. Okay? And there are different types of domestic political regime in the world. So a lot of the 20th century was essentially a competition between three different ways of organising societies, three different sort of types of domestic political regime, communism, uh, liberal democracy and fascism. And in many ways I think we're going to see a uh, growing competition uh, in the coming years between digital variants of uh, liberal democracy on the one hand, in particular in the United States, and uh, a digital authoritarianism that's uh, growing in China. Okay? And, and that's really simply because the United States is a liberal democracy now. We can get into the whole thing about Donald Trump, all that kind of stuff, and everyone laughs. But essentially, the US is a liberal democracy, uh, and China is an authoritarian state. One can have a whole discussion about which is better and which is worse and so on. But that is, they have different domestic political regimes, and they are going to use these digital technologies in different ways, because these digital te technologies are fundamentally, in many ways, dual-use technologies. So, for example, if you speak to tech companies who, who are global tech companies, this is one of their key things. How do we sell things across the world that are essentially dual-use? That's a massive challenge for these guys. So, what does that mean for innovation in the public sector? So, the first thing to say is, is authoritarian states can innovate. So, for example, so I've got a forthcoming book. Uh, uh, in which we have uh, edited a book in which we have a wide variety of contributions for different people in China, Russia, and, and, and China, Russia, and so on. And if you look at what's happening in China now, for example, they are experimenting and innovating. It's, they have a heterogeneity of different uh, uh, local projects 
uh, using big data and a variety of other digital techniques to, to uh, uh, understand what people are doing, to uh, predict people's behaviour, uh, to modify people's behaviour and so on and so forth. Okay, so they're building all these things at the moment, they're doing so in a very uh, sensible and innovative uh, fashion. Uh, we obviously need to, uh, in the West, um, compete with that. So, uh, and we need to do so in a way uh, that doesn't create uh, or, or tries to mitigate the dual use nature of these technologies because a lot of the technologies, a lot of the digital technologies are fundamentally dual use in that they can be used not only to make things more efficient and nice and fair and lovely but they can also be used uh, uh, for uh, surveillance, uh, control and so on. Um, so, uh, to give you uh, one example, so if we're thinking about, say for example you're thinking about uh, uh, digitisation in Poland, or the UAE, so the United Arab Emirates, or uh, uh, Hungary, for example. So if you are building digital systems, uh, you're digitising government in those countries, are you doing so in a way that means that if those countries, for example, uh, 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 change or become more authoritarian, that, that, those, that you're not building systems that will perhaps even make them more authoritarian or can be used uh, by those regimes as they become more authoritarian. So I think that's a really critical issue. And this wouldn't matter if democracy was on a roll worldwide. It's not on a roll. So I think most people who work on this would agree that it's actually democracy has been receding for the last 10 years or so globally. So to give you one tangible example of that, uh, so our introduction talked about silos and breaking silos. I would actually say we need silos. So we need to make sure that we have silos between the public, a lot of public sector data and private sector data. We need to have a lot of silos within the public sector because it's precisely the use of breadth and depth of data that actually can be very dangerous when you give government uh, too much power. I'm not some kind of lunatic libertarian. Uh, I'm very happy with government doing a wide variety of things, uh, but we need to be uh, sensible and careful about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the provocative thoughts that I'm sure are going to be picked up for some of the audience members. <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you. They were a fantastic uh, set of comments so far. So hopefully I'll add to those from my own particular perspectives. Um, my name is Natasha McCarthy. As mentioned, I'm from the Royal Society. We are the UK's National Academy for Sciences. Um, and we do a lot of work to bring kind of the evidence around science and technology and engineering to policy. In particular, as mentioned, we've worked on machine learning, data governance, privacy-enhancing technologies, and we're interested in the ways that those technologies can inform policy making and can inform in innovation in policy. Um, so what I'll do now is take, sort of make three points about how we can encourage sustainable innovation in the public sector, building on three different projects that we've carried out at the Royal Society. So as others have said, Data is going to underpin significant innovation in the public sector, um, and the public sector is a rich source of data, um, and we need that data to be in a good format, we need that data to be trustworthy. And so there are various things that have to happen to turn that data flow through the public sector into data infrastructure. Um, and in particular, one thing that we've looked at at the Royal Society is how we use technologies to govern the use of data effectively. So there are lots of needs in terms of standards, in terms of regulation, in terms of good codes of practice. But what role does technology have in ensuring that we use data in a well-managed way? And my colleague Frank and I spoke about this briefly yesterday in one of the parallel sessions, but we had a report out uh, just about a month ago on privacy-enhancing technologies. And the point of that work was, have we got the technologies to enable us to analyse data while protecting sensitive aspects of that data? Have we got the technologies to link data together without putting it in one great centralised pot where it is potentially at more risk? Um, and in that work, we said that there's a particular role for government with its rich set of data and with its interesting data challenges to help find the use cases that promote research into these privacy-enhancing technologies. This is a technology area which is very diverse. There's lots of different technologies, different methods. They're all nascent and in development. But we think there's a particular role for government in stimulating that research and bringing it to a point where we can use technologies to enable this well-protected access to and use of data. So investment in that, I think, will be a really important way of, um, sort of sustaining innovation based on data in the public sector. The second point is about skills. We've heard that education and use of data is absolutely essential. 
We carried out a project uh, recently, Tom Smith was involved in it, looking at the dynamics of data science skills, and it's a really dynamic area. In the period between 2013 and 2018 in the UK, there was a 1,287% increase in job openings for data scientists. There was a 542% increase in job uh, openings for data engineers. There's an absolutely huge kind of marketplace of people with data science skills. And that's across all sectors. How does the public sector kind of compete when there's going to be employers from kind of business and uh, lots of different people wanting to bring in those skills and make use of the data assets they've got? In that work, we kind of highlighted some of the specific drivers for data scientists. And yes, working in industry, getting a big salary is really, really interesting to people, of course. Um, but people are also stimulated by the availability of good data and good questions and projects with good social benefit. And the public sector has heaps of those things. So I think we need to think about the way that the public sector can use those particular sort of facets of how it works to attract data science talent and to be able to make the most use of the data that it holds. And once it's got that talent in, it has to think about how it keeps up with this very volatile, very dynamic skills landscape to make sure the people working in the public sector have the most cutting edge skills working with the best data technologies. Then the final point is that we can't have sustained or sustainable innovation without significant public trust and confidence in what the public sector is doing. We did some work on machine learning and we looked at the public's attitude to how we use machine learning technologies. And some application areas we looked at were health, uh, policing, social care. And what we found was that the public have very different views on the use of things like machine learning and other data-enabled technologies based on the specific application or area of use. There's no one opinion about machine learning. So people felt that policing was a good use to, way to use machine learning, but were worried about stereotyping and bias. They thought social care could uh, be made more efficient by using machine learning, but were worried about dehumanising it. They thought health, in particular, had great prospects, so they were more confident about that. And what that shows is that to have trust that we are using kind of data-enabled innovation in a way that people have confidence in, and in a way that people feel is for the widest public benefit and the greatest benefit of society, we need sustained kind of engagement with the public on specific uses. And that requires kind of mechanisms and good knowledge of the best ways to carry out that sort of public engagement as we develop new sort of uses for data and new innovations. So the three main things are, I think, Thinking about how we use technology to turn data flows into good data infrastructure, thinking about how we retain and attract really good data science skills, and thinking about how we have sustained, deep and meaningful engagement with the public about using data to innovate in the public sector. Thank you. Next one, at least. Jack? Uh, no, uh, on the contrary, thank you very much. And uh, as I said, uh, apologies <coughs> for uh, being somewhat uh, dishevelled and uh, sort of coming here a little bit uh, half cocked. This it was, uh, this jacket was white when I put it on this morning. Uh, but uh, my name is Jack Tyndale. I manage the all-party parliamentary group on design and innovation. And uh, I'm largely here uh, in uh, substitute to Lee Rowley, who uh, was one of the MPs who co-chaired uh, our most recent report uh, on uh, technology and tech ethics, which we launched in Parliament last week. So it's quite good that I think we've got so many timely reports and research um, on the go. Really. So I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the main outcomes that we found in our report and uh, hopefully then we can, which I think naturally has quite a lot of overlap with um, some of the topics that we've discussed here and also very gratifying to hear that there's a lot of overlap with the panels here as well. Um, I mean, I suppose I'll start off by saying that, you know, um, I, I mean, I, I, I live in Canada Water and I normally run into work. At, um, uh, so our office is based down the river near, uh, near Borough. But I was running to work this morning, and it, my race, my when I was sort, sort of taking back uh, past HMS Belfast, and I think particularly what Nick was talking about quite now about the sort of nature of future and the nature of hard power and soft power, and I don't think you would find a better example of uh, sort of the changing nature of how we approach what makes countries powerful than HMS Belfast, because. Sort of 70 years ago, it was in the North Atlantic, uh, helping to protect the Arctic convoys during the Second World War. Uh, now, of course, it's a floating museum ship and attracts millions of people around the world. So a better example of going from hard power to soft power, I don't think uh, you could find a better example of that. Um, I, you know, and, you know I, I quite like to run to work as well. I um, don't anything to sort of keep me off grid. I don't have a, you know, make sure that TFL doesn't have my metadata, so I'm very particular about that. 
Uh, and then obviously I go into Nostrada, make sure that's proper, make sure that I've taken my Spotify payload list on, and make sure that's all in my iPhone. So that tends to be how it works. Um, the report that we did with the old party parliamentary group on data analytics um, really sort of came out for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one, however, was predominantly to look at what we consider to be a very rapidly changing area of public policy in this area. You know, uh, less than two years ago, the government set up the new Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which, uh, broadly speaking, looks into how we can apply um, the sort of growing examples of data and data-driven technologies into the public realm. So that was very timely for us when we decided to put it on. And um, broadly speaking, it was a sort of about a nine month long project and we looked at four key policy areas. So uh, connected on autonomous vehicles, healthcare policing and education. As you could expect, we could probably done a full report, probably an even longer one on any one of those individually. Uh, but what we were very keen to get at, and I think probably ties in quite well with the uh, sort of approach to privacy that the Royal Society reported as well, is that we were less bothered about finding out specific policy solutions for how you run connected on autonomous vehicles, for example. What we were very keen to point out is what are the key areas of both success and failure in terms of how policymakers, so Parliament, Whitehall, and other sorts of governmental organisations are actually engaging with that data. And I thought this really did highlight some really sort of key, key and critical issues. Um, I think the first one that we really wanted to look at was the nature of regulation. So it goes without saying that the, I think more than any other sort of area of public policy at the moment, the, the huge exponential rise in data and data-driven technologies. I mean, I think the famous thing that points out that we've had more data generated over the past 10 years uh, than we've had basically in the whole total of human history. I think the, there was one stat I saw in uh, Foreign Policy magazine that said that, you know, you go back to the ancient world and the greatest depository of information is probably the legendary uh, Library of Alexandria. And obviously, you know, it was looted and destroyed and eventually sort of uh, completely destroyed when um, uh, Augustus Caesar destroyed the Ptolemaic dynasty. Uh, you can tell I did history, can't you? Uh, but uh, the fascinating thing I found out about that is that most estimates say that the average human being has about 350 uh, libraries of Alexandra's worth data on them personally. And, uh, and I think that just seems how the huge area of here, and naturally, as you would expect, and we were talking quite a lot about the uh, nature of um, you know, more authoritarian regimes, and the fact is that I think we'll have to assume that that sort of data-driven uh, approach to uh, the amount of information that we have on us is now going to be the norm, and frankly, if liberal democracies aren't utilising it, it doesn't matter, because um, number one, authoritarian regimes will, but I think also crucially, so will uh, anti or outside state actors, particularly criminal uh, organisations, the black market, the grey economy, etc, etc. <coughs> so those are all areas that I think we need to look into as well. And unless we have clear regulation in that area, we're really going to struggle, I think, to um, uh, address those failings that we've had in other areas. I mean, I think the classic example here, of course, is Bitcoin. Um, so many countries are sort of trying to regulate or even sort of criminalise the use of Bitcoin in certain key areas. I think we can debate whether or not uh, that is sensible. Obviously, some financial institutions are using it, but frankly, it's, some, it's an area that I don't think you can ever possibly regulate out of existence. So I think the key sort of policy recommendations that we're particularly looked, looking at here is to make sure that uh, these new sort of areas of data-driven technologies are being regulated in a way that is better, not necessarily being regulated more, but uh, from our perspective as well, it's how that is implemented both by state actors and industry and extra-governmental organisations as well and I think sort of the third key area that we also had to look at, our main academic advisor uh, for the report was uh, Professor Luciano Floridi of the Oxford uh, Internet Institute, who provided a huge amount of advice and data for us in this respect. And I think the crucial thing, uh, Floridi of course coming at it from what's broadly speaking a ph philosophical background here, is again this dichotomy that I think exists between um, what I suppose you might call uh, ethical, uh, ethics by design, where you sort of come in with a certain approach to how, you know, a, a sort of preset nature of recommendations rather than what we might call pro ethical design, where you approach how those technologies are utilised in different areas. I think the example that he used for was, was 
you know, an example of prior ethical design is a speed camera, uh, because, you know, that does not stop you speeding. However, if you speed, it most likely will be logged and give you a ticket, and that is your choice whether or not you speed. Whereas, of course, you may well have a speed bump, which physically causes you to slow down or causes damage to your vehicle. Now, where, of course, we put that sort of dichotomy of speed bumps in technology versus speed cameras in technology, I think is an area for us to look at in other ways. But I think that's all that changing, as is, I think, the constantly evolving nature of privacy. And as we pointed out, you know, the, the fact is these technologies are the natural sort of way that I think the economy is going. Uh, but even Klaus Schwab, who, of course, is the uh, guy who, broadly speaking, is noted to have come up with the concept of the fourth industrial revolution. He didn't come up with it, but he pretty much coined the term. Even he noted that, and this is going on for about 10 years ago now, noted that privacy is going to constantly change, and we will probably see a bigger shift in the nature of privacy over the next 10 years than we have had since, certainly since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So, but nevertheless, I'll make sure that this report is circulated as well, and you know, looking forward to seeing where we take discussions in that respect. Thank you so much, Jack. You can, you can keep this. Um, I actually have a question for all of you, because I, if I draw a line among several things that have been said, um, at UCD, where I um, am at the moment the acting head of division of the reform of the public sector division, where we work on digital government, open data, data-driven public sector, and public sector innovation, um, one of the weaknesses to foster public sector innovation in a sustainable way that we've identified across government is the existence of a leadership that is capable to actually embrace what all of you have said, which is that innovation is not about technology, or the technology can support innovation, but it's about transformation, and that requires a change in the culture, um, focus on education and reskilling or attracting some of the talent within the public sector. So my question is, I think that came up quite strongly in all of your interventions, the importance of having the right type of skills within the public sector. And my question concerns more <coughs> leadership. So to what extent in your experience you've identified that a, in, across the public sector there is a leadership that has the right understanding of what public sector innovation means and therefore provides an environment where innovation is incentivized motivated, allowed, and enabled uh, by civil servants. Who wants to go first? Yeah, so in terms of the kind of leadership skills that I think are important, um, for lots of these areas, I think one of the key skills is kind of horizon scanning and kind of looking at the at future. Um, because I think it's about, firstly, the ability to foresee really positive potential uses of technologies and think beyond the current situation to what you could do with the technology. It's the ability to see the potential unforeseen consequences of what might happen. So thinking not just about you know, what we could do with technology, but also being able to see what the risks are. And therefore, that's the skill to help develop what's possibly needed in terms of, say, anticipatory governance or regulation. Nesta, the organisation, recently been thinking about this concept of anticipatory regulation. Because all of those skills together, I think, are the, those, those horizon scanning skills are essential for enabling kind of safe and rapid uptake of technology. Um, and we just heard about the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, and I know that has this anticipatory foresight function. And I think that is going to be really important in kind of giving good advice and giving good leadership for innovation in the public sector. It's thinking about what the technology can do, but also thinking to ahead to how we make sure it does that in a safe and well kind of governed way, given the potential future risks. I maybe share, uh, because I'm doing similar things for the public sector and also for the private sector. And uh, you mentioned uh, I wrote the data innovation strategy for the Swiss Federal Statistical Office. I did similar things for big uh, private sector companies. So from an abstract point of view, it's exactly the same thing, how you tackle data quality, how you make pilots, etc. But what's really is the key difference it was, again, leadership. This is top down. So leadership, for example, in the public sector, the experience I have is more they fear a little bit. We cannot, we are not allowed to do any mistakes because citizens are looking at us. Uh, we paid by tax money, and in the private sector, there is this uh, fail, uh, fast learn faster mentality because you also have much more engineer backgrounds in some companies, and they know we have to try it, and then we know whether it's working or not. And this is a little bit the leadership skill, which is currently really a lot of uh, several companies have developed at the C level, 
which is currently missing a little bit, this, this, uh, this fear to make mistakes. And this once again comes me back to the questions about, you have, it's about communication, it's about transparency. And this is the same thing, this going out to the citizens and telling them, we try at least something, some new innovative ways to make things more sustainable. This is a little bit the fear a lot of companies, at least the ones I know in the public sector, mm -hmm. they fear a little bit. Yeah, so I'll just say that very concretely that uh, in my experience, uh, policy makers, as well as decision makers who use uh, algorithmic data-driven systems to decide, for example, how long a person gets to uh, stay in jail when they're sentenced for a crime, that they lack a basic understanding of what is data, what is an algorithm, or what are the kinds of things that you can fix by fixing quotes, bias in the data, what are the kinds of things that you cannot fix in a way that is purely confined to technology because these are social problems that technology just amplifies. Uh, so we really need all hands on deck in developing uh, short courses uh, to teach policy makers, to teach decision makers like judges uh, and also public defenders and you know everybody in, who is participating in this environment where algorithms and data are entering to be literate uh, in the space because at the moment basic literacy is lacking at every level. So senior leaders, uh, I mean I think, I think one key thing when one actually interacts with uh, really senior people is that they just have so little time. So you may think data is really critical and they have to know about data and they have to understand all of these wonderful new data technologies, but they have so many different things they need to think about. They really don't have a lot of time to get to grips with data. So uh, I spent a lot of time in Washington and I was there a few weeks ago and I'm very, very senior, very, very senior decision maker and he gave a, a big talk about the future of the, the, the thing that he works on and, uh, and discussion and about half his comments are about AI and, uh, and so on and so forth and big data. Uh, and for example, he talked about uh, a book, uh, The Master Algorithm, that I think probably a few people have read by a, a chap, a professor at UC Berkeley. And it's, a, you know, it's amazing this guy managed to read this book, to be honest with you. I mean, the amount of meetings these people have. So I think you're never going to get more than a gist <laughs> to people uh, in really senior leader, leadership positions. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, thinking much more than that is, is, is just in, in, infeasible. So they're not going to get a gist. So what should that gist be? The gist, in my opinion, needs to be a clear narrative. So brilliant book if you're interested in strategy. One of the best books by was uh, was by Lawrence Friedman. So Lawrence Friedman, and he wrote a book, brilliant book called Strategy, uh, published uh, I think 2013. And he looks at business strategy, mis uh, military strategy, and socio-political strategy. And the, and the gist of it. Across all of those things, you need a key script. You need a script or a narrative or a story or whatever it is. Uh, and that both guides you, that guy, and that leads, enables you to lead people and guide them forwards. So what should the, what should the script be? Uh, the script should basically be something along, along the lines of, uh, we need to innovate because if we don't innovate, we're going to be left behind uh, and we're in a competition. Uh, but simultaneously, we need to defend what is important about our government and political system. And so we need to protect the, the things that we value. Uh, I think probably for people in the UK and, and, and America and, 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 and allies and so on, that, that would be essentially liberal democratic values and so on. Uh, the reality is that a lot of the way that's going to move forward is going to be through events. So for example, if you're thinking about cyber security, uh, people really cared in the UK when the NHS, the National Health Service, uh, was hit by this, essentially, the, the, the uh, cyber attack a while ago, which is essentially, it wasn't aimed at the NHS. So, and then you need to take advantage of those key events and use that to drive forward your particular narrative. Okay? And I think one other big danger, and I get especially in Germany, actually, is the idea that GDPR and things like that, Stifling innovation will never be able to, because Europe has no tech giants other than SAP, and which is a me medium size in the, in the global scheme of things. We, we, we are nowhere in Europe compared to America and China. I think that's important for people to, to realise. Uh, and, um, but that doesn't mean that in order to compete with China and America, we need to adopt exactly what they're doing with data. We don't need to have the American approach of a much 
much freer access to our data, and I think we certainly don't want to adopt the Chinese approach of joined up data across public and private, uh, and so on and so forth. We need to still protect what is important to us here, in Europe in particular, which is uh, data, privacy, and, and so on and so forth. Clear narrative. And this is the easiest bit when you're last, because you can just sum up what other people have said and make yourself look a lot more intelligent. Uh, I think that's um, a really good point, uh, particularly I think, with regards to how to engage with policymakers. I mean, I think it, it, it's the nature of certain politics in the UK, but definitely most of the uh, equitable nations as well, is that ministers and sort of senior civil servants do, by their nature, tend to be generalists. Uh, you know, you come into junior minister or ministerial office, you'll stay there a year, 18 months, maybe two years, then you're shunted around somewhere else. Uh, so I think from, in some respects, that's negative, because you can't always assume a huge amount of inherent knowledge uh, on certain areas. But at the same time, it does encourage a system where people are quite adaptive as well. I think the, the, key, the, I think the key challenge is to make sure that you have an element of essentially maintaining some expertise within the relevant government department. Uh, certainly, as we talked about with regards to Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation being set up, uh, one thing I will say is as that centre develops, and I think it has a huge amount of potential, but it's absolutely vital from my view that it maintains a key ministerial champion. So, look, there were arguments about whether or not you move it from DCMS to the Cabinet Office or to the Department of Business Innovation and Skills. I don't really think that matters too much. I think the crucial thing is the fact that it does have a ministerial champion and a government department where it is based, number one. Um, the other thing I think though that we can sometimes have with regards to things like innovation as well, look, government always wants to boost innovation. It always wants to promote things. Um, I think there's a couple of ways to do that. Broadly speaking, if you want to have some examples of where government can innovate quite well, it's always really at its best when it sets a clear challenge to industry and basically says, right, you go off and solve this problem. Um, and that's something that I think works in pretty much every single system. The obvious example I think of this is probably the space race. It's always sort of brought up in this argument that, frankly, um, the Soviets wanted to put satellites into space, so they set up you know, a very large sort of network of uh, organisations that went round and solved that problem. That was exactly the same approach that the Americans approached. Um, and you can argue about which side won. Um, so the Americans always claimed that they won the space race because they reached the one arbitrary target they set, sending a man to the moon, and that said, right, that's it, we've won the space race. Uh, but nevertheless, both of those, you know, the archetypal liberal democracy, the archetypal authoritarian uh, regime, both approached the situation in a fairly similar way. Um, but I think you can sort of boost that sense of innovation. One thing I will say, and we've talked about it before, and going to some of the things I also said is, sometimes, however, you can decide in a liberal democracy that things are just wrong, and you can just say, we're not doing this. And I think the obvious example that we've seen in data recently, uh, I think it was San Francisco, uh, where San Francisco just said, uh, we're not having facial recognition anymore. We're not using that within the criminal justice system. We're not using that in the police. And there are times when it comes to things like that, particularly in areas relating to criminal justice, where you can just arbitrarily say, we're not doing something. I think that's important, but it's important to make sure that that is used sparingly. Thank you very much. I have many questions in my mind, but I'd like to open the questions for the floor to have the opportunity to address uh, the panel. So please uh, ask a question and let us know if you want it to be addressed by one panelist or by the whole I'll shout. Uh, Tom Smith from the Data Science Campus in the UK. Um, there's obviously a huge risk around misuse of data, and it's great that ethical concerns and, and so on be explored so deeply. But there's an equally important risk of missed use of data and of not using data for better services, for better policy, and so on. And in the spirit of innovation, the, in the spirit of innovation and public sector government innovation, there is a debate to have here about the risks and the trade-off between those approaches. So how do we take that debate out of this professional forum, which brings together industry, academia, and governments, and get that into informed public debates? We're very interested in your views. Uh, a possibility was a really link to what Julia mentioned before about education. And I think you have a wonderful society, which I'm a proud fellow, which is the Royal Statistical Society. 
which tries to create this uh, data city or data literacy to the policy makers and also to the public. And this could be a way to educate the, the public with respect to basic statistical data literacy, which has exactly to do with this. Misuse of data means you approve the data that it's usable. So this is indirectly related to the quality of the data, so of the trustworthiness of the source of the data. So you have to engage already as a in kindergarten, etc., with kids going like this. Where did you get this information? Okay, check the source. Do we have trust in the source? And this has to do with education. I think the Royal Statistical Society in the UK does about, at least uh, what I see from Switzerland does a wonderful job with it. And this is the future which it should go, which is fully in line with what you told about education. Yeah. Thank you. And so this is actually my cue to maybe talk a little bit more about the nutritional labels idea that, that we have. So uh, nutritional labels we have all seen, right? They are standardized representations of the contents of a food item so that a consumer can hopefully make an informed choice uh, about whether or not to consume a particular food item, right? Um, so with, with data science today, uh, I don't think that we can be fully comfortable with just saying that we trust the data set because we know that it came from trustworthy sources. We also need to know whether a data set that we have, and even if we trust it, is fit for use for the particular set of tasks that we have in mind. Because one data set, no matter how high quality that data set is, may be perfectly appropriate for one set of inferences, and completely inappropriate for, you know, out-of-sample generalizations, for example. Uh, so the nutritional label metaphor is a broad one uh, that we want to carry over into the data science space that can really explain in a human understandable form. Now the question is, who is the human? Is it the data scientist? Is it the regulator? Or is it an end user? Or somebody who is actually being affected by a process? So, for example, a homeless individual who is being offered a particular kind of public assistance, but not another kind, and they want to understand why it is that this kind of assistance is offered to them and not this other, that they perhaps desire more. Um, so these labels, they need to be descriptive, they need to be true, they need to actually explain the quality and the fitness for use of a data set, and in the case of uh, consumer-facing, data subject-facing labels, we want for them to also be actionable, to allow people to really make a decision that, that would alter their outcome, that would improve their outcome. And so this is a very promising metaphor on which I invite all of you to contribute and, and to work with us. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we carried out work on governance of data use with the British Academy a couple of years ago. And one of the key things that we pointed out in that report is that when you start thinking about the governance of user data rather than, say, simply the governance of kind of the collection and storage of data, you come across these kind of ethical tensions. And the point between you know, misusing data and misuse of data is just that sort of tension. The tension between using data versus protecting it. The tension between thinking about the individual's rights and concerns about data that might sort of reveal sensitive information about them versus the desire for socially beneficial use of data. You know, the, the need to kind of protect data that is going to bring value to companies versus using data for innovation across different industrial sectors. So good governance of data is about navigating those trade-offs. And one of the things we said is that we need kind of uh, an open and transparent way of navigating those trade-offs. So you need to involve people in discussions about how do we make this kind of balance. Um, and so one of my points earlier about uh, public engagement is that when we think about new ways, in, ways of using data, you need to work with the kind of different uh, stakeholder groups and the public to work through that, those tensions. But instead, as well as having that kind of discussion about how you... Um, get through these potential dilemmas. I think one of the ways to give people sort of trust that there is the capacity to do that effectively is through things like the right institutions who are thinking about those dilemmas, like the Centre of Data Ethics and Innovation, and also believing that there are the right tools in place to be able to manage them too. As I said, our work on privacy enhancing technologies is thinking about how much can technologies themselves enable us to get through these dilemmas between using data and protecting it. And the more we have confidence that the right institutions are in place and the right technologies are in use, and I think that we can have kind of trusted and good quality conversations about how we navigate these essential tensions of the use of data. Uh, so, um, 
uh, just, I suppose, uh, very briefly, um, in terms of um, how we sort of get that public buy-in and that public engagement, I think one of the key problems that people have is just how complex data is and the multitude of things that it can be used for, even in the public sphere. I mean, one of the key areas that we were having a look at with regards to healthcare is how quickly people's perceptions change when you talk about their medical data being used. You talk to the average person, they are absolutely fine with their GP having access to their medical data because they know who their GP is, they trust their GP. It only goes down slightly when you talk about the NHS as a whole because everyone likes the NHS, a very trusted public body. The second you start talking about, oh, well, can the NHS sort of share that data with a drug company, say, or a pharmaceutical company to develop new technologies, all of a sudden it plummets. I mean, it more than halves because ultimately people like the NHS, they don't like Pfizer, despite the fact that, you know, it's just a natural nature for how industrial policy and economic policy works that you have that interaction between public sector bodies and private sector bodies. Uh, to solve problems. So I don't think there's anything new about that necessarily. And I think data is just, when we talk about data, I mean, we've had data for ages, but you know, certainly that sort of use of mass data is only evolving there and we need to find some sort of way to do it. I think it's quite good that we have the center that's already starting to talk about having things like citizen assemblies and actually going out and talking to normal people uh, about that. But ultimately, I think, frankly, politicians need to lead by example. And the way to lead by example is to use data and crucially to use statistics in a positive way. I think it's quite engaging that people like the ONS have now said the Office of National Statistics have really started calling out politicians, uh, ministers, shadow ministers who use statistics and who use official data in irresponsible or misleading ways. I think it would be quite good to see Parliament uh, starting to censure people who use it in that respect as well. But I think it's a question of having to lead by example and crucially it's also making sure that people are really aware of who is responsible when things go wrong. I think probably the, it's often times brought, uh, brought up that if connected and autonomous vehicles become the norm, if connected, you know, if, an AV, if an autonomous vehicle crashes, who is responsible for it? And again, people, once people are aware of, well, is it the manufacturer? Is it the people who owns it? Is it the person who did the algorithm? Is it the, is it the car itself? Sounds silly, but you know, we've had corporate personhood for you know, well over a century now. I think that's one of the key areas as well. So it's about, number one, politicians and ministers using statistics and using data in a responsible way. It's making sure that people are actually being engaged proactively with it. And crucially as well, it's making sure that people are aware of the legal ramifications for what happens when things go wrong. Okay, I'm going to be extremely brief. I was going to try and give you some fun factoids instead, really, rather than anything coherent. Uh, so the first thing is, I remember there was a brilliant, I forget the precise statistics, I'm afraid, but uh, there was a brilliant thing where they asked MPs, British MPs, to just uh, do some simple statistical, like, probability calculations. Oh, like, yeah. Really simple ones. And only 75% of Labour MPs and 50% of Conservative MPs could get these super simple calculations right that you'd need for, you know, to pass your maths things at the age of 16. So I think there's a limit to what we can expect in leadership, but, you know, yeah. obviously one, one does one's best. Uh, second thing is Oscar Wilde. So Oscar Wilde said the problem with socialism is that it takes up too many evenings. Now you all clearly find digitisation fascinating or you literally wouldn't be here. Uh, but most people don't find it interesting uh, and uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, and that will always be the case. And so I think, how does one make it more interesting? I actually think things like, I mean, real policy people talk about Black Mirror. They say, oh, did you see that Black Mirror? It's like Black Mirror. Oh, the, the, the Chinese social critic system, it's like Black Mirror. You know, things like, which is now owned by Netflix. I'm a bit concerned about that. But, um, uh, but you know, things like Black Mirror. The BBC, for example, has an important role to play in the UK as a public service broadcaster. I actually think, you know, that's the type of thing we need to be doing a lot more of as well. Um, you need to make it more uh, human. So Alexa, so I wrote a piece in Slate magazine, which is a American magazine, on, on Alexa recently. Because if you're going to talk about, and I was talking about you know, corporate conflicts of interest and dry things that nobody's really very interested in. Uh, but how do you do it? You talk about Alexa. There are 100 million Alexas. You talk about how there'll be more, Ale you know, more digital assistants than humans by 2021 or whatever. You make it human. You, you talk about things that are in people's living rooms and then people care about it, it makes it real. Uh, and I think that's really critical. And in, as you said, you know, the individual level is really important. And finally, there's a really important point. So this is a key thing for uh, public health, for example, which is when you give people a fearful message or, or you're just trying to do any kind of influence thing, you have to give people something they can actually do. So a lot of these debates, 
uh, basically come down to Facebook is good or bad or whatever. But what, for example, we, you know, we're not America. Uh, we're in Britain, for example. But we can't, we, Elizabeth Warren won't be elected Prime Minister of the UK, uh, and, and even if she were, she couldn't break up Facebook uh, uh, in the UK because Facebook isn't British. So what can we do? And I think we need to be realistic about the things that we can do and talk about things that we can do in the UK. For example, things like we don't have uh, uh, television political adverts, paid political adverts. Right? It's illegal in the UK. It always shocks Americans. Uh, and, and for example, I think we need to be arguing for things like we should prevent that uh, online paid political advertising as well. So we need to give people things that can actually be done. Uh, to coin a phrase, we need to uh, give people the option to take back control. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, hello, I'm Steve from the uh, European Commission. I work in the Justice and Consumers Department, which has uh, also did much discussed GDPR, but also other things like new approaches to personal insolvency. Uh, and I would, I would ask to hear from the panel um, what exactly is the kind of innovation that we should expect in the public sector? Because it sounds a bit like that we should expect the same kind of innovation that from, the, from the private sector, like this left behind argument, as if we were competing for profit or market share, which is most of the time not the case. There are some exceptions. Within Europe, countries are competing for, for people. There are some countries that are losing people massively, and, and some countries are winning. So there are some... But what kind of... And just to give you some examples, I think, I think limited liability was a major innovation, right? Uh, the right to abortion was a major innovation. Uh, general suffrage, uh, general vote for, uh, for voting for everybody was a major innovation. Recent things like privacy legislation are a new regime for insolvency. So, isn't it something that the, the private, isn't it something where the private sector can, uh, the public sector can do something where sometimes the private sector would even like to do it, but cannot commit to it. They cannot achieve it together. We call it a market failure, but because they cannot, they have no mechanism. They don't have something like the rule of law legislation. And I, I would extend the question on the competition even to uh, competition and innovation. I'm not even sure that we want political parties to compete over private sector innovation. Frankly, I, I, quickly, I quickly come to a nightmare scenario when I think that through. So isn't it not a completely different kind of innovation that we should look for, expect for in, in, the, in the public sector than the kind of innovation that we look for in the private sector? So I'd like to ask you to be brief in responding because you're getting to the close of the panel so everybody can answer. Yeah, so in the US we're bringing cases now against Facebook and other platforms uh, that concern using demographic characteristics to advertise for jobs, for housing, right? So, uh, and essentially where, where this is logically leading and this is where we might end up is that Facebook and Google and Twitter will be forced to abandon target advertising practices based on demographics. And this is certainly something that is absolutely against their business models. This is hitting their bottom line directly, and we expect them to put up a fight, a really, really difficult fight, right? And yet, this practice is something that is uh, infringing on the civil uh, liberties. And so, this is clearly an example of where regulation is necessary, right? Where the private sector were certainly not regulating itself because it's directly against, uh, against their incentives. I'll just be very quick. So in terms of innovation, I think there's, you don't have to be like innovating and doing something that's never been done before. I think uh, I, the number of people I know in the British government whose email systems don't work properly or they have like an inbox limit that means they can't receive large attachments is massive. So I think a lot of innovation is just like catching up with the public sector and things like email. I think that's you know, really, really important. Um, second point is... Uh, market failures. I completely agree that's somewhere where government uh, uh, can play a real role. So to give you one tangible example, so um, a little while ago, some people from the American government, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, we had a meeting in um, uh, Silicon Valley, which was all about trying to deal with a particular type of what I subsequently realised was a, a market failure, in the sense that people are developing a lot of dual-use technologies for targeted advertising for essentially offensive psychological operations, you could say, uh, against consumers. Right? There's loads and loads and loads of dual, of dual use uh, 
uh, things for influencing people. But what is being developed to try and give people the tools to protect themselves? You know, the shields to protect themselves against this targeted advertising. Because that's, that's in almost no commercial uh, application's interest. not in Facebook's interest, not in Twitter's interest. So that is the kind of thing where you know, there's a market failure there, lots of offensive tools, let's like, try and give people the money and time, etc., to develop some defensive tools so people can protect themselves from some of these, uh, from some of these things. Yeah, that should just be outlawed. Okay, a short response will, one will not be surprised with my background. So let's call it education, innovation education. So data and statistical literacy for the masses. So basically starting at kindergarten to really create this data culture for the next generation. And this will be a key innovation. And this should be now that's what's called globalized, so local for the country, but also standardized on the global level. And this for me would be preparing the future that our our next generation. I was going to make exactly the same point. <laughs> um, so um, thinking about the future of work, so we've seen a huge um, amount of literature about how AI might change the future of work. And we've done work to think about um, how technological changes in the past have changed work and affected people. And what we know is that technology changes tend to bring benefits to the broader population, but it takes time. And some groups, and in particular the more vulnerable groups in society, can be very adversely affected in the meantime. And one of the key ways, I think, to kind of... Uh, deal with that challenge and uh, therefore one of the key ways to innovate is to prepare people for the jobs of the future and that means rethinking the way we do education. Jobs are changing and we need to change the way we do education and we need to innovate in the education system so that people start their kind of careers with a really broad base and the flexibility to do lots of jobs in their lifetime and have the means and the access to resources throughout their lives to keep learning, to keep retraining, to get the skills that are needed by, uh, as jobs changed based on technology and other factors. I think rethinking education and innovating in that space is absolutely essential. And uh, likewise, just to uh, sum up as well, so in, in addition to the uh, all party group on data analytics, I also manage the APPG for design and innovation. As you can imagine, there's a lot of crossover in that respect. The one thing I've always discovered about design uh, is that people very rarely notice good design. They always notice bad design. If, uh, <laughs> that's the point. Uh, and I think, as a, and, and I think indeed. Uh, but I think if you have a look at where I think an unquestioned success that's happened uh, in recent years in terms of improving design from a government perspective, it was gov.uk. So it used to be about 10 years ago, you had this multitude of, you know, literally thousands of different websites uh, from all single government departments, agencies, etc., etc. Uh, there was absolutely no sort of central hub for that. Most people, uh, if they wanted to renew their driver's license or get a new passport or something, I had to go, like, Google it and go through like a multitude of different places to find it. Gov.uk just put all those websites together, bare minute, the, only the information that people wanted. If you want to find out more, you can, but a single sort of point of view, same typeface, very sort of clear, basic design, very few pictures, and that has had a huge success in terms of how people actually engage with public sector services. There's no question now about how you need to renew your passport. And that was a very good example of government realising where there was a clear error in terms of engagement. What I think would now be necessary for people to have a look at, and government in particular, is when we've done that for engaging with public services, how do we actually do that for engaging with democratic institutions? Because if the one thing that we have seen, and I think um, the Brexit referendum, uh, however much you criticise it, that actually did make people interested about politics. And we had <laughs> the largest turnout uh, for a poll, a nationwide poll, for a generation, quite literally, because people were engaged. I think it's absolutely vital that we don't lose that level of stuff because if, go if liberal institutions don't do it, then we are going to see authoritarian institutions use it as well. So I think that's probably the single biggest challenge for policymakers is to make sure that you know, this broad swathe of liberal democracy we have in this country, make sure that they are properly engaging with people because if they don't, then the people on the far left and the far right will. Thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting uh, way to close the conference. Um, as you said, innovation is not something new, it's something that has been happening across the public sector and in the private sector for forever, basically. So what does it mean? Probably the right question is, how do we make it sustainable in the current context? And I found it extremely interesting what you said, that the relevance is to make it 
sustainable for the generations of the future and to prepare for the future. And that requires a whole set of actions around trust, collaborations, engagement, um, around having the right governance and proving the impact. So thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Please join me. In